So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, you know, my old friend Wagner uh, very kindly invited me to, you know, to spend some time with you uh, in these few days. And <clears throat> we're gonna have three classes together. Uh, part, there will be a little bit of a, a repetition of uh, what uh, you probably heard in the previous lessons. Uh, but, uh, you know, the time that I want to spend with you, uh, I want to help you by giving you an overview about uh, how we do proteomics today. And then, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll go into a little bit more details about the potential uh, of the type of proteomic analysis that you can do, uh, you know, especially using mass spectrometry. So today is going to be mostly about uh, uh, how uh, we identify and quantify proteins. Actually, let me give you a quick overview. Uh, okay, so this is going to be <clears throat> the agenda for the next three days uh, that we're going to spend together. Uh, today, we will focus on, on the instrumentation on mass spectrometry. I actually should mention that uh, today, proteomics is not only done by mass spectrometry, but uh, uh, this is what we're going to focus on now. Maybe towards the end, I'm going to tell you uh, a few other ways that we analyze proteomes today. Uh, anyway, tomorrow uh, we'll discuss some uh, exotic application in mass spectrometry. You will see how we can uh, analyze proteins not only in terms of their uh, identification and quantification, but also uh, their structure, also their uh, turnover rate, also their localization in the cell. Um, you know, there is so much information that we can extract from a, from a proteome. Uh, and then on Monday, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about data analysis. And I know it's tough on, on Monday morning, but I, I think this is probably going to be uh, among the most useful things that we can discuss because, you know, you guys, as young as you are, like you are the scientists of the future. Uh, so, you know, in five, ten years' time, uh, you're not going to have a lot of trouble generating Large, am large amount of data, uh, you're going to have uh, a very challenging task of making sense of this very big data. And, and proteomics is one of the disciplines that produces a lot of data. Uh, and you are, you know, you're going to be able to, you know, to transform this table, to extract meaningful information, to be able to tell what is the biology in this large spreadsheet. Anyway, Enough with introduction, uh, I'm going to give you a brief uh, panoramic about uh, where we are with proteomics, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, we do all of these things. So first of all, <clears throat> proteomics today uh, now is a very widespread technique, and we have reached you know, a very sensitive and very comprehensive uh, levels of, of proteome characterization. Now, this, this uh, uh, cover uh, from Nature Journals is now old, it's from 2014, uh, about, you know, 10 years on delay compared to the human genome. Uh, we came out with this uh, collection of papers where people have claimed, okay, we have finally mapped the entire human proteome. And it's not really true because proteins are very complex, they have isoforms, they have modifications. Uh, but now we have repositories of data that contain many, many, many uh, identified proteins from the human proteome, and they, we claim to have nearly the entire proteins map, at least for, at least for humans. Um, that is just in terms of sensitivity. You know, in terms of uh, uh, other dimensions that you can explore your, your proteome, you know, we can, we can map the location of our proteins, you know, uh, around the cell, around the tissue. Uh, these are techniques using, uh, um, developed with a technique called uh, MOLDI, uh, which I'll tell you in a minute, uh, where we can go and map the position of proteins in a tissue if you cut it in a slice. Uh, and here down here, uh, this is an example about how large are the molecules that we can detect in a single mass spectrometry experiment. Uh, this is probably not even the largest, but just to give you perspective, we can now analyze even intact viruses uh, just by spraying them uh, into the mass spectrometer. You know, the, uh, the times where we were excited that because we could 
apply a peptide, you know, they are you know, long fast. Uh, now we can analyze much, much larger uh, macromolecular complexes. And the workflow for proteomics, I'm sure you heard this already, so I'll be quick, but basically you can analyze protein from nearly any kind of tissue or, or cell type, like as long as you can homogenize a tissue and get uh, your proteins in solution. Uh, once your proteins are in solution, you know, the standard workflow is that your proteins are being digested uh, with some sort of enzymes, you know, to make them uh, simpler to analyze. So usually we don't inject intact proteins in the mass spectrometer, we chop them into smaller peptides, which is somehow the same type of strategy that we use for um, any kind of omics. Also, when you analyze DNA, uh, you know, you don't, you know, put in the sequence of, you know, the entire DNA, you know, you, you cut it into pieces, either using enzymes or sonication, and then we analyze DNA fragments. And the same goes for proteomics. Uh, we don't normally inject intact protein, we usually chop them into shorter peptides. Uh, and then of course, you know, the analysis is performed using mostly uh, liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrography. After the analysis is finished, <clears throat> usually you get these big tables that I told you about, uh, where you have a lot of proteins identified and quantified. And this is where the fun starts, you know, when you actually start converting these tables into meaningful networks and, uh, you know, biological outcome. Uh, and these are just some of the examples of, of the things that we'll very likely discuss on Monday. And um, just a quick reminder about why it's so important to do proteomics and why proteomics is not the same as doing RNA sequencing, the transcriptomics, is because proteins compared to RNAs, uh, they have a, a variety of properties that usually RNAs don't have. So protein uh, drastically changes its function depending on where it's localized in the cell. You know, if it's in the nucleus or the cytoplasm, proteins are likely to have a different function depending on where they are in the cell. Uh, proteins, they never act alone. You know, they interact with other proteins, they interact with um, uh, nucleic acid, they interact with lipids, and of course, uh, you know, their interactions uh, are critical uh, for their function. And these are information that you cannot extract from, uh, from an RNA-seq analysis. And then finally, of course, uh, proteins are um, very uh, highly modified. Uh, and this is uh, also extremely important, as we'll discuss in a minute. And finally, just a couple of slides about uh, the applications for proteomics. So proteomics is widely used in uh, basic science. You know, lots of, um, I think nearly every institute uh, has, uh, you know, a proteomic facility uh, where proteins are being analyzed with, you know, there, there is some, usually some lab that takes care of that. Uh, but you also find proteomics, for example, in the hospital. And, uh, um, and people use uh, proteomic analysis um, attempting to basically screen uh, for phenotype of, uh, of patients. You know, this is just uh, uh, how it would work in, in theory. And this is an example of, uh, you know, real applications where uh, people already now, uh, they actually use proteomics, for example, to, um, uh, to um, diagnose a specific type of cancer. Uh, this is this is a company that uh, runs in Australia, you know, near Sydney, uh, and this company has uh, I think six or twelve mass spectrometers now. That when they get um, you know a, a, a biopsy from a patient, they perform proteomics, and then using machine learning, they try to associate it with uh, different type of cancer uh, isotypes that they that they have. All right, so. Let's step back and, you know, let's uh, decide together uh, how uh, we got here, you know, so why uh, mass spectrometry has become so successful to identify and quantify thousands and thousands of proteins in every single experiment. So it all starts, actually it all started very long time ago. You know, the, the first mass spectrometer uh, was developed by Sir J.J. Thompson, uh, who got, you know, 
a bunch of Nobel Prizes for, for a number of reasons. No, actually, <laughs> uh, he got it in uh, 1906 for, uh, um, for actually something completely unrelated to uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, but uh, the reason because I show you this slide is because what you see here on the right, actually, this is, I, I, this is the very, very first mass spectrum that I could find, you know, anywhere in literature. Uh, this was J.J. Thompson, uh, you know, uh, spraying uh, neon uh, into, this, uh, uh, into this spectrograph. And basically, those, you know, those lines that you see are actually uh, spectra that are, you know, uh, represent the masses of the, of the molecules that are being, you know, injected. Uh, what you see here is actually something really interesting. Here in the bottom, you see these two lines. So this line here represents the mass of the neon 20. And this one is uh, another signal that actually represents the neon 22, which is the isotope, you know, the most abundant isotope in nature of neon. Uh, what is interesting is actually until then, nobody knew what an isotope was. You know, this is the first spectrum that helped uh, identify uh, isotopes in, in atoms. So we fast forward to, to the 80s, and then uh, uh, in the 80s is when people really started speculating that you can use mass spectrometry to identify proteins. You know, back then, you know, mass spectrometry was, of course, not used for this reason. And it was, it was used for other applications, and as you can imagine, mass spectrometers back then were not at all, you know, user friendly. So uh, people have been wondering: so why do we need to spend so much effort to to spray a, mo a molecule that very likely we already know, uh, and then just observe a spectrum that represents the mass of that molecule? And and the answer was in this, you know, visionary people that <clears throat> they they took a guess back then because back then it was so not obvious. Uh, it's obvious today, but not in the 1980s. Uh, their guess was, well, we need to use mass spectrometry uh, to analyze proteins because all proteins are modified. And uh, we need a device that is able to tell us what are the masses of these modifications so we can identify them. You know, in the 1980s, we knew that histones were modified. Uh, we knew a few other proteins that were modified, but uh, protein modification back then was definitely thought to be the exception and not the rule. Uh, and today we know that there is basically almost no protein that doesn't have modification. So it was a, it was a wild guess, but it was very accurate guess, you know, back then. Okay. <clears throat> so. What is a mass spectrometer and, you know, how, it, how it's made, right? So uh, a mass spectrometer, we're not going to go into very detailed technicalities, but uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, uh, you get an overview about, uh, you know, the different types of mass spectrometers and why we use them, right? So mass spectrometers are generally divided into three components. You know, there is an ion source, there is a mass analyzer, and there is a detector. So the ion source is the device that we use to uh, inject uh, our molecules into the instrument. Uh, the mass analyzer is the component of the mass spectrometer that we use to define the mass of the molecules that enter into the instrument. And the detector is the device that helps us to tell us how much of that molecule there is. So uh, it's basically uh, you know, the quantitative component of the mass spectrometer is the detector, as I will show you in a minute. So let's start from the ion source. <clears throat> ion source, I'm just going to spend a couple of slides on that. Uh, ion sources, they have one job, and it's basically to uh, take your sample and convert it into gas phase and charge the analyte that uh, you want to inject into the mass spectrometer. Why do we need to charge that? Because a mass spectrometer is made of electric lenses, right? So in order to drag your molecules into the instrument and analyze them, you know, they need, you know, your molecules, they need to have a positive charge or a negative charge. If they are not charged, they are not going to be, you know, uh, sucked into the instrument. They're not going to be analyzed. And there are essentially two type of uh, ion sources that we use today. 
Uh, we have the electrostride and we have the molding, the stage for matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. So the difference between these two is that the electrospray takes um, solu um, a sample in a liquid state, and then uh, it basically by uh, vaporizing it, uh, it, uh, it basically uh, evaporates the sample, goes in a gas state, and that's how it gets charged because there is a voltage applied to the, to the electrospray tip. Uh, in case of molding instead, your sample is on the surface. Uh, it's covered with the matrix that is just helping the ionization. And then there is a laser that hits this sample. And then the sample basically sublimates. It goes from solid phase directly to gas phase. And then uh, when it sublimates, these, these molecules, they get charged. And that's how they can be analyzed by the, uh, by the mass spectrometer. And you know, remember when I show you this uh, slide, where you could uh, image molecules and proteins specifically on, uh, on pieces of tissue, that is actually nothing else than molding. So you take your slice of tissue, you put it on a surface, and then by hitting it with the laser, you know, in you, every pixel of the image becomes a spectrum. And that's how you can tell you know, where your molecules are because you know where are the masses corresponding to your molecules. Uh, these two um, ionization methods, they led to a uh, Nobel Prize in the early 2000s, and uh, we still use them today. In particular, we use electrospray because um, since it uses samples in liquid, it can be coupled with uh, online liquid chromatography, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, this is how they look in the lab. You know, these are pictures from our lab. Uh, you see, this is an electrospray. This is uh, the device that gets connected to the mass spectrometer, you know, the liquid is passing through this tube and then it's coming out from this tip. This tip is electrified, it's also hot, that also helps to the, the vapor, uh, vaporization, let's say. Uh, and the molding is nothing else uh, than, uh, you know, this laser technique and the sample is just being spotted on this plate. Uh, you know, once you have uh, your sample here, this white power part that you see, this is the matrix. Uh, then uh, you put that into the instrument, and the instrument hits it with the with the laser. Then, <clears throat> what happened in the late 1990s is that is something that is it seems like a small uh, incremental science, but in reality it made a total difference, and that's how everybody uses proteomics today. And in the late 1990s, uh, people scaled down the flows of their liquid chromatography. So uh, the problem with uh, spraying a sample into the mass spectrometer with a very high flow, let's say with liquid chromatography that flows in hundreds of mic microliter per minute, which is usually the, the range of, of flow rate that you use, for example, when you do LCUV, when you, you, when you do ultraviolet detection, for example. Uh, the problem is that if you have a very high flow, it's difficult to generate this efficient uh, vaporization of your sample and you know your samples are inevitably more diluted into a bigger volume compared to a small volume so basically people work hard to generate HPLCs that pump uh, liquid in the nano flow range so in the, in the nano liters per minute and then uh, with a very very low flow rate then the ionization efficiency becomes much more efficient you know that your sample is more concentrated you can use much, much less material. And that's actually how, uh, you know, we do it today. Even, you know, now uh, you will see, you know, growing like mushrooms, all of these conferences on uh, single cell proteomics. Um, I, you know, I would say we are not really doing single cell proteomics with the same efficiency as we analyze normal proteomes yet, but we are going in that direction. And you see what is the characteristic of people that analyze single cell proteomes, they use chromatography at a very, very, very low flow rate. Actually now uh, the, the flow rate range when people run uh, single cell proteomics, let's say is 20, 30 nanoliter per minute. So you can imagine that your columns are extremely tiny capillaries because you know, since the liquid um, uh, has a flow rate that is so little, you, know, you need to have columns with a very tiny volume. And in fact, I'm going to show you a picture. 
these little capillaries. Uh, that's how uh, that's how we pack our columns today. You know, these capillaries they have a very small internal diameter, you know, 50, 100 micrometers. Uh, we create a tip. This becomes our electrospray, and then these capillaries are packed with material that we use to um, that we use to separate uh, our molecules, and we can run them in the nanoflow range. You know, very very low flow rate. Uh, this is this is just them, you know, connected in front of the mass spectrometer, and this is how we pack them. All right. So, ion sources we discussed it, right? So the job of the ion source is to convert your your sample from a certain liquid or solid phase into gas phase and and charge it. So now it can be detected by the mass analyzer, and the mass analyzer is actually the the uh, basically that's how uh, characterizes a specific mass spectrometer because they are of different types and these different types you know uh, they usually give the name of to the actual instrument so what types there are there are essentially four families of mass spectro uh, of mass analyzers and some of them uh, are you know they provide a very very high mass accuracy because they have a very high resolution and uh, some of them are really inexpensive uh, some of them are really fast, others are not, uh, and some of them are big devices and others are not, right? So that's the thing is, uh, there is not one mass spectrometer that is perfect for all applications. Uh, there is actually, uh, the reason because we have different types of mass analyzers is because they have different properties and they are more or less useful for different applications. You know, this is actually um, something uncommon in science, uh, usually in science, you have a, <clears throat> at one point you have just a better technique that comes in, and then you know everything else goes to retirement uh, as it you know as it happens during evolution. Uh, but in mass spectrometry, there are still different types of mass analyzers that can be used, and they all survive you know the evolutionary pressure. We still use them today because they have complementary properties. You know, there's not one that is perfect at doing everything. And I'm going to show you now the difference between them. Let's start with the, uh, the time of flight. The time of flight is probably the most uh, intuitive. Uh, so basically, uh, I'd like to start from here. It's also the first modern mass analyzer that was uh, uh, created uh, by actually this guy named William Stevens. Uh, he patented it in 1952 at the University of Pennsylvania. That's actually where I did uh, my postdoc. This is the, this is a picture of the patent of the uh, of the time of flight back then. So the time of flight, <clears throat> actually, with this one, we should be able to uh, make clear for everybody how a molecule that enters into a mass spectrometer produces a spectrum where you know the mass and you know the intensity. So imagine that your, uh, you have your electrospray or your molded, uh, your molecule is being ionized, you know, gets charged, it gets injected into the instrument, and then once it's in this analyzer, there is a gate here where all the molecules are aligned, and then they are shot into this long tube that is in a complete, well, complete, let's say, in a, it's in a very high vacuum. So there's no air inside, right? Because otherwise the molecules will collide and break. Uh, so the, the molecules are being shot in this tube. And then at one point, they hit the detector. Now, what is interesting about that is that the instrument knows when it's shooting the molecules, and then the detector defines when this group of molecules hit uh, the detector, right? So um, the smaller the molecules, so and the faster is the time that it, you know, and the less is the time that it takes for them to hit the detector, right? So the uh, the first group of molecules that they will hit the detector in 2.5 milliseconds, and then there will be another group hitting the detector at 3.5 milliseconds, and then there will be another group hitting the detector at 5 milliseconds, right? So Right now, the mass spectrometer doesn't know, you know, what group of molecule is the one at 2.5 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds. But because we calibrate our instrumentation, we know how to convert the time into a mass. 
because we know that a certain mass there takes a certain amount of time to hit the detector into the time of flight. In, in, in exact, to be accurate, we don't really uh, analyze masses. We analyze masses over charges. So um, a molecule that has a mass of 500 with one charge uh, flies the same as a, mass, a molecule that has a mass of 1,000 with two charges. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter because anyway, we can easily convert mass to charge into mass. What is important is uh, how we convert you know this this time into uh, into a mass, and this is this is actually the formula. You know you don't you don't need to learn it by memory, uh, but this is basically what you get in the end, right? So you get um, a spectrum. This is a spectrum uh, that you have on the x-axis. You have the mass to charge, like I told you, and then the y-axis is the intensity of the signal. So these molecules here that they form this signal. These are the ones that hit the first, the detector, and then these, and then these, and then these, and then these, right? And the y-axis of the spectrum is how many molecules they hit the detector at that precise time, right? Because the detector counts those molecules. So in the end, you can provide the two-dimensional graph where you know in the x-axis, you know the mass, on the y-axis, you know the intensity of that molecule. And this is absolutely essential for, for, for the success of proteomics because we need to know how much of a protein we have, not only which proteins we have. All right, and then I, I'm gonna go brief through the other mass analyzers. You know, you just need to remember that, you know, they are a little bit different. Uh, they have uh, some uh, complement, they, they function in a different way and they have complementary properties. For example, uh, the quadruple, and it doesn't detect masses based on <clears throat> the time that they take to basically hit the detector. And it defines the mass of molecules based on their ability to pass through uh, these four uh, um, charged rods with, that have a specific oscillation frequency, right? So um, there is an alternate voltage on this um, uh, quadruple. And then only the molecules that have a specific mass to charge, they are basically passing through uh, the, you know, this cube. Uh, and the ones that have the wrong mass to charge, they basically discharge on the, on the rod and they don't hit the detector. So by changing the oscillation um, um, of, of this voltage, you actually uh, filter a different type of, uh, different type of masses. And I use the term filter on purpose because um, uh, because of its mechanism, the quadrupole is actually uh, an analyzer that is really not efficient at defining accurate masses, but is the most efficient mass analyzer at filtering masses. So if you want only one specific type of molecule to hit the detector, then uh, what you can do, uh, you can just use a specific oscillation of this polarity and keep it fixed. You know, you always use the same type of oscillation. Then there will be only one type of uh, mass that actually goes through uh, the quadrupole. You know, if you remember, we could not do that with the, with the time of flight. Once the molecules are in the analyzer, all of them eventually will hit the detector. But the quadrupole can be efficiently used as a filter. And you will see how this will become very useful in a minute. Then uh, uh, we have another family of mass analyzer that is the ion trap. Uh, the ion trap is actually very similar to the quadrupole in its mechanism. Uh, the difference and potentially the advantage is that uh, the ion trap can not only filter molecules, it can also accumulate molecules. So if you have a very, very low signal and you need uh, to uh, enhance the sensitivity for that signal, the ion trap is a better device than the quadrupole because you can use it to accumulate uh, molecules for longer time before you end up in scanning them. Now you cannot do this with the quadrupole. The molecules are passing through. You know, there's no way that you can accumulate or, or trap them. But uh, with the ion trap, uh, this can be done. And that's how you gain uh, sensitivity uh, if you want to perform a scan of very low intense signals. And finally, <clears throat> the last uh, family of mass analyzers is the one that we call the Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance. And you know, this, this complicated term basically defines uh, 
mass analyzers that define the mass of your analyte based on the oscillation of these molecules in a certain device. So this, this uh, analyzer are a little more modern uh, than the um, analyzers that I showed you before that are more like from the 50s and uh, 1950s. Um, this one, uh, these are uh, uh, more recent and then uh, they have, um, you know, they, you, you won't see a lot of them around. Uh, you know, these are not used much for proteomics uh, because they are, uh, they provide a very, very high um, resolution, a very, very high mass accuracy, but so high that most frequently we actually don't need it to analyze our peptides. Our peptides are relatively small molecules, so we don't need this enormous resolution to, uh, you know, to define them. And the reason because they are popular in some specific applications, and uh, it mostly for, um, you will see them often, for example, in um, petroleum science, uh, you know, in people that analyze very long chains of um, uh, carbons, uh, for example, yeah, either polymers or oils. Uh, and that's because the, the difference between, you know, these molecules sometimes is like a double bond or, or a single bond when you need a very, very high resolution to tell uh, these things apart. Um, otherwise, you know, you won't see them much in, in, uh, in you know, in, in, uh, in mass spectrometry. Why they have such a high resolution, you know, and why they are so big? You know, they are so big because they have this enormous magnet, and then uh, uh, this magnet is used, you know, when the molecules are injected into the analyzer, they start spinning around this magnet. And then uh, every time uh, there is, a, in one corner, there is a detector, and every time they pass through that detector, uh, the instrument counts uh, the, the intensity of the signal that is hitting the detector in that moment. And they keep, you can keep spinning them for a very, very long time. So the reason because they have such a high resolution is because the more they spin, the more all the molecules with the same exact mass, they align, and then they form a very, very sharp uh, you know, signal which is something, for example, that you cannot do with a quadrupole. So uh, in the end, you can get this super high resolution because also for another reason, right? So in physics, uh, frequency is a, very easy, uh, is, a, is a very easy thing to measure, right? So you just, uh, the detector is just counting how many times a certain signal passes through the, the, uh, you know, the detector. And then in the end, once you have the resolution that you need, you know, you decay the molecules and you make a new injection. So they are extremely expensive. Uh, they are extremely, uh, you know, complex to install in a lab, uh, but they provide a super, super high uh, resolution. What happened in, in the mid 2000s is someone, uh, look at this Fourier transform type of instrument. And they say, can we make it simpler? So then uh, it will have maybe not a, such a high resolution, but it will use the same principle. So to quantify, uh, sorry, to, to detect the mass of molecules based on their oscillation frequency and, you know, become, you know, practical for, uh, let's say, for, for labs that don't have all of these resources. And, and you know, this guy, Alexander Makarov, <clears throat> he created a smaller, Fourier transform type of device that actually doesn't work with the magnet. It was, this is just a, an electrified uh, fuse. And then basically it works with the same principle. Actually, let me show you the, uh, you know, the idea behind it. So when these molecules are injected into this mass analyzer, they start spinning on the analyzer with the oscillation that is inversely proportional to the mass. Like this is the oscillation frequency this is the mass. So the smaller the mass, the faster is the oscillation frequency. So the, the blue molecule is the smallest one here. And then there is a detector here that counts the oscillation frequency of these, of these molecules. And then we basically produce a spectrum. This analyzer is called the Orbitra. is actually very compact compared to the magnetic sector that um, uh, I showed you before. 
Uh, and then basically now is installed in um, uh, at the moment exclusively uh, with uh, only one type of vendor uh, type of mass spectrometers. But the Orbitrap is today, you know, the most widely used um, analyzer for for proteomic experiments. You will see that you know even when I told about the human proteome, um, you know, uh, issue in in nature, you know, all of these data were actually generated with. Uh, mass spectrometers that had, as a one of the mass analyzers, they had an orbital. All right. So <clears throat> now that we went through, you know, the different types of uh, mass analyzer, it's almost uh, 9 a.m., so I won't take, you know, too much longer of your time. Uh, I wanted to tell you something that is extremely critical, you know, to understand how we are so confident that the molecules that we detect in our mass spectrometer is a certain peptide or a certain protein. And the thing is, uh, what I told you so far is that uh, mass spectrometers are not really <coughs> uh, designed like this anymore. Uh, today, they are more like designed like this. So they actually have still the same component, but uh, they usually have analyzers in tandem. The reason because they have analyzers in tandem is because uh, one analyzer can be used to filter molecules, and then these molecules can be fragmented. And then the other analyzer is used to actually define the fragmentation pattern of these molecules. And that's when we get more accurate information about what kind of molecule uh, we have. I wanted to show you a practical example, uh, so then uh, you can follow me better. Um, this is a video, this is a commercial video, so ignore the, the publicity, but uh, this is a, a video of a mass spectrometer that is made of two analyzers, a quadrupole and an ion trap, and in the middle uh, there is a collision cell that is used to break molecules. So the idea is that here you see the electrospray, and you see the molecules that are being injected inside the mass spectrometer. These are just lenses that they pack you know, all the ions that enter in the instrument. These gray ones are, you know, ions that are uh, molecules that are not charged, so they are being discharged. This is the first analyzer. So the first, the job of the first analyzer is to filter a specific molecule of interest. And then this molecule can enter by itself into the collision cell. So when it breaks, you know that you are generating fragments only of one specific molecule. And then, once these fragments are generated, the second analyzer, uh, the job of the second analyzer is to analyze those fragments. Now, this is an ion trap, but you, what you will see in a second, you will see these fragments that are being, uh, you know, separated according to their mass, and they hit the detector, and then the detector sends the signal to the computer, so you have generated your spectrum. So you see that here, in this way, we analyze not masses of molecules, but also their product, there are fragmentation patterns. That's what makes it much more accurate to define what molecule, uh, uh, what molecule is present into your complex mixture. Uh, uh, this one, what you see here, and uh, this one is the a cartoon of uh, one of the most typical mass spectrometers that we have now in laboratories. Actually, this one doesn't have an orbitra. Uh, this one is a mass spectrometer that has an electrospray and like I told you, this is a bunch of lenses to uh, conduct the ions inside the instrument. Uh, the analyzers are this one. You have a quadrupole, and then here you have a time of flight. Right? So this is where how you resolve molecules when they eventually hit the detector. In between, this area here, uh, and I'll forget about the different components for a moment, uh, this area here in the middle, this is the collision cell. This is uh, where your molecules are being fragmented, uh, you know, when they pass, when the collision cell is activated. Usually the, col the collision cell is filled with a gas. Uh, it has to be an inert gas. It cannot be oxygen because otherwise it oxidizes your molecules. Um, it has to be either a noble gas like uh, argon or, or neon, uh, or it has to be a gas that is uh, uh, inert in the sense that it will not react with your molecules. So for example, now, a lot of instruments, they just use nitrogen. You know, nitrogen just forms this N2 molecules and it's just, you know, it's not reacting with your, with your analyzer. 
So when your molecules, they enter in the collision cell, there is a very high voltage here, and the high voltage basically uh, shakes your molecule at a very high kinetic energy, and they hit with this gas, and they break. You know, that's how, uh, that's how we fragment our molecules. And you will see in a moment why peptides fragment in a specific way. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what I wanted to tell you from this slide is you, you might have noticed that the configuration of the, this instrument is not random. You know, there is first a quadruple, then a collision cell, then a time of flight. And you remember what I told you in the beginning, like uh, not every mass analyzer is good at everything. You know, some of them are really good at filtering molecules, other they have a higher resolution to uh, give you accurate masses of molecules. And there is an obvious reason why this instrument is configured this way. is because if you want to fragment a specific molecule, you need in front of it a filter. You know, an uh, analyzer that is not necessarily give you a higher resolution, but is very good in isolating only a specific type of molecule. So imagine that all of your molecules come in into the instrument, and then the quadruple is basically letting pass through only the molecule of your interest, you know, when you program the mass spectrometer in a certain way. So then when you fragment this molecule, you know that you have very little interference, and you don't have fragments that come from other co-isolated molecule. And then the fragment, when they go into the second mass analyzer, the time of flight actually has a very high, is a high resolution device. Uh, so in the end, when the fragment hit the detector, you have their masses with a high accuracy because the analyzer that is in front of the detector is an analyzer that can provide a high mass resolution. So there is a reason why uh, the instrument is connected like this and not, you know, in the other way around. You know, this is called the Q-TOF because it has a quadruple time of flight. You will never hear anywhere of a TOF Q, right? TOF Q don't exist because it doesn't make any sense to have a first a time of flight, then a collision cell, and then a quadruple. So uh, here is exploiting the potential of complementary properties of different mass analyzers. And um, let me go forward here, and let me show you this. <clears throat> now, this is uh, extremely important. If you didn't discuss it already in class, uh, you know, this is the time, you know, to, to, clear, uh, to clear out, you know, how we know that the specific spectrum is a specific problem or a specific peptide. And that's because when a peptide <clears throat> enters into the mass spectrometer and you filter it and you fragment it, you know, this peptide breaks into pieces, right? And it generates a spectrum that we call MS-MS spectrum because it's a tandem spectrum. It's not the intact mass. It's the fragment of an intact mass. And then uh, uh, the fragment that this peptide generates, uh, they have a very specific pattern that corresponds to the sequence of your peptide, right? So that's how we know that this specific spectrum is this specific peptide. How do we know? You know, let's say this is the peptide sequence that is being injected in the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer isolates that mass, breaks it, and then you see the fragment coming out here, right? So these fragments here, uh, so I like to explain it like this. Imagine that you have a million molecules that enter into the mass spectrometer, right? Uh, and then these million molecules are being fragmented. Let's say 10,000 of them they break here. Another 20,000 breaks here. Another 50,000 breaks here, and, and so on and so on, right? So in the end, you have uh, um, molecules that are broken in only one bond, and uh, every time you break this molecule, you form two fragments. Let's say if you break it here, you form a fragment made of SGFL and another fragment made of EEDELK. Right? So because we know the mass of the amino acid, we also can easily predict what would be the mass of a fragment if the peptide breaks in this position. Right? So if it breaks in this position, we will have two fragments, one with a mass 405 and one with a mass 762. So this is the, the B ions. This is the you know, left series. 
and the y ions, this is the right series, right? So let's say uh, we break it here. If we break it here, we have two fragments, B3 and Y7, and these two. We break it here, we have two fragments, B4 and Y6. We break it here, we have B5 and Y5. And then we, that's how we build you know, this spectrum. Then, how do we know what is the sequence of this peptide? That's because the mass difference between this fragment and this fragment corresponds to the mass of the leucine. The mass difference between this fragment and this fragment corresponds to the mass of the glutamic acid. And that, you know, we know that the mass difference between these fragments are the masses of the amino acid that compose this peptide. And that's how, uh, you know, of course this is done automatically by a software, but that's how we can easily reconstruct the peptide sequence when we have a, a fragmentation spectrum. And uh, there is a, there is a, actually, let me close in a second, the office door. Okay. Um, the, there is a reason why they're called the B and Y fragments. Actually, you will hear from Professor Peter Robstock next week. Uh, that's because when you look at the, um, one second. Thank you. When you look at the, uh, when you look at the, um, um, at the molecule of a peptide. You know, a peptide, you know, is the result of amino acids that are basically ligated by, uh, you know, by this amidic bond. You know, you lose a molecule of water, that's how you create the, you know, amino acid chain. And then if you look at the backbone of these uh, peptides, they basically can only have three types of bonds. You know, there's this bond, this bond, this bond, and then this one is the same as this one, right? So this is just the next amino acid. This is just the next amino acid. So there are only three places in the backbone that you can break a peptide sequence. And uh, the thing is, if you, if you, let's say, if you assume that you have only three types of cleavages, let's say the left end, you just call it ABC, and the right hand, you just call it X, Y, and Z, the B and Y fragment are the ones that are the most probable to form when you hit this molecule to a gas. Why they are the most probable to form? Because they are the weakest. Uh, because the bond between the nitrogen and this carbon is the most polarized. So the oxygen likes to steal the electrons from here, the nitrogen likes to steal the electrons from here. So the, the bond that connects these two atoms is not as strong as the others. So when they, these molecules, they hit with the gas, these are the first one that fall off. So this is actually very good for us because if you, if you would break your molecules everywhere, then you will have many more fragments and will become more complicated to reconstruct the amino acid sequence. But they break only one place, that makes it much easier. But you will hear that from Peter Robster, I'm sure, because he's the one that invented the nomenclature. And, uh, and just a couple of slides before concluding. <clears throat> Now, the question, the, the final question you might have is that, okay, but you need to tell the quadruple, or anyway, the first mass analyzer, uh, how to, you know, which molecules they should be selected and fragmented, right? And when you have a very complex proteome, you don't know that because there are molecules of all kinds and you don't know when they are being injected in the mass spectrometer because if you run a chromatogram, it could be that a certain peptide comes out here or comes out here, you know, you don't always know. So the way uh, mass spectrometers work today for proteomics is that they don't need to know. You know, they, have a, um, they are programmed in a way uh, that they have a, a cycle. It's called the data dependent acquisition. They have a cycle where they, um, you know, every, let's say every second, they uh, perform a scan where they look at what are all the signals that are present, you know, that are coming out from the column in that precise moment, right? So you have a full uh, spectrum. Uh, what, you, what you have, you have, uh, you know, this signal, the software basically lists, okay, I have this signal, this signal, this signal, this signal, this signal, they all need to be fragmented. So what it does in the following scan is select one signal after the other. So the quadruple select isolates First this molecule, then this molecule, then this molecule, then this molecule, 
and it breaks each one of them. So from after a single full scan, there will be a series of a number of uh, MSMS scans for which you generate a fragmentation pattern for each of these peptides. Uh, at the end, you end up your run with uh, hundreds of thousands of spectra, and then uh, the software will collect these MSMS spectra and it will identify you know, what kind of peptides are those. And, you know, one way of thinking, maybe because it has been one hour, uh, maybe I'll finish here uh, because this one, uh, uh, the, the next step is something that requires a, a fresh mind. Maybe we can start tomorrow with this. Uh, I don't know, uh, you guys tell me if I'm being too specific or too vague or, you know, too technical. That's great. Uh, I think it's uh, complementing perfectly what I said in the beginning because uh, I just gave an overview of uh, what can be done from proteomics and what are the general approaches. And then you're providing further detail and how it works. So it's it's just uh, almost nothing overlapping. Okay, okay, perfect. So um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, how, you know, how the software uh, converts these spectra into a protein list. And maybe I can start tomorrow with that, you know, so we don't, uh, you know, overwhelm anybody. Uh, you, you tell me. I don't know how long normally these classes are. Uh, it's, it's up to you. One hour, I think it's it's great. If you'd like to move on, or if you prefer to break it here, it's uh, let me let me think for a second. You, um, the point where you think it makes more sense to to break and continue tomorrow. That's okay. Uh, let's do this. Uh, let me just spend three more slides um, to tell you about this part. So tomorrow we can start directly with the other aspect of mass spectrometry that is quantification. Uh, so then uh, we, we, we basically start with a new fresh topic tomorrow. So three more slides, you guys survive with me, uh, and then we're done. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is a, you know, you saw in theory, right, how we convert a spectrum into, um, you know, into a peptide name. Now, uh, I'm going to show you in practical what happens uh, uh, automatically, you know, by our software, how spectra are used to convert them into peptide lists and then eventually to protein lists. So <clears throat> the thing is, you know, this is an, an SMS spectrum, right? So this is what you have at the end of a run in mass spectrometry. So you don't know yet, you know, what is this? You know, you can try to calculate it manually, but of course you cannot do this for, you know, for a million spectra every run, right? Because proteomics generate tons of spectra. So uh, what we do, um, we actually use, um, we, we perform something that we call database search. And uh, there will be a lot to talk about this, you know, the, we can go into uh, tiny details, but what is most important is the general uh, concept. Uh, first of all, we use, uh, we use, um, we are very grateful to genomics in the sense that uh, uh, the reason because proteomics exists today is because we can predict what kind of protein sequences are present into our samples. So, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we've mapped uh, DNA, um, you know, and then the DNA can be converted into RNA, can be converted in silico into a protein sequence. So we have today databases, enormous databases of protein sequences of all kinds, you know, from human and from a lot of other organisms, right? So imagine that these protein databases are just basically list of protein names followed by amino acid sequences. And then, you know, for the human protein, for example, we have 20, 25,000 uh, proteins uh, from, uh, you know, if you look at bacteria, then we have millions and millions. Uh, actually, I think we look at the other day, I think we have a hundred million something protein sequences. So depending on what organism you're working with, you know, the, the protein can be very complex or not so complex. Uh, but the point is, in the end, you have this, uh, you know, notepad files where you have protein names followed by sequences. And then these sequences, <clears throat> they are used by the software 
to convert a raw file, so a file that contains only spectra, into a protein list. And this is done by what we call you know, database search. So essentially, the concept is this one. So you have a spectrum, and then your spectrum has a specific fragmentation pattern, and this fragmentation pattern, in order to be converted into a protein sequence, it has to match a theoretical fragmentation of one peptide that is present in your database. So we have a, uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, in all of the protein sequences that we have in the database, you know, if we digested our proteins with a certain enzyme, we tell that to the software, the software converts these protein sequences in theoretical peptides. And then for these theoretical peptides, we actually know how they would theoretically fragment because we know their amino acid sequence. So we know that they will form a fragment like this, like this, like this, or like this, right? This, what you see here in blue, you see a theoretical fragmentation pattern. And then, uh, one second. Uh, and then uh, when this uh, uh, theoretical fragmentation pattern matches with a certain efficiency, with a certain score, you know, your observed spectrum, that's when you have an identification. That's when you say, okay, this spectrum is this peptide sequence right here. You know, obviously some matches will be, you know, more accurate, others will be more noisy. So in, in the end, you know, these software, they provide the score, you know, how good uh, this match is. Uh, and then of course, in the end, what the software needs to define is what kind of score is good enough. So the very last, Step uh, of the <clears throat> the very last step of the of the database search is a sub, um, you know there are some algorithms that basically calculate what is the probability that this match is random or this match is accurate. That's how you get a score. That's how you get a validation. Now this one is probably not necessary to go into too much details. Uh, maybe we can talk about it another moment. Uh, but basically, you know, we need to estimate uh, a false discovery rate. You will see in every proteomic paper, you will see um, uh, in the methods, you will, you will see written like the FDR, which is the false discovery rate, was filtered for, I don't know, less than 1%, which basically means that you have a very, very low probability, less than 1%, that any of these spectrum matches are, you know, by chance. And then, of course, the probability that the protein is identified by chance is even lower because many, many spectra usually define a protein. So uh, with this, yeah, with this, I would actually, I think I would like to stop here because the next thing I want to tell you about, uh, I want to tell you about quantification. So now you know uh, how a peptide or protein is being identified by a mass spectrometer. What we're going to discuss tomorrow is how we extract the abundance of this protein and how we use it basically to uh, basically to, to provide biological meaning. So yeah, uh, Wagner, I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop here. Right? Uh, I, have, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they feel, but uh, I, I, I felt like I told them a lot of stuff. Oh, that's okay. Uh... No problem. I think we can discuss if they have some questions and uh, move on tomorrow. Yeah, any question? Vamos lá, pessoal. Perguntas em português ou em inglês? Yes, they are shy. Oh, no problem. You know, I understand. You know, we'll get to know each other in the next days. So uh, they, they will be less shy on Monday, I'm sure. E aí, gente, nenhuma pergunta? É... Tá bom, vou perguntar. É, hello, Professor uh, Simone. Thank you hello. for the, the class. It was very uh, clear. Uh, I would like I'll open my video here just to make it more okay.
é, uh, I'm Reinaldo. Uh, so, uh, uh, since you, you talked about the, the transition from, from microflow to, to nanoflow in the 90s, uh, in, in the last couple of years, there, there is something coming back using the microflow for proteomics. Uh, I, I've been seeing some articles. So I'd like to, to know your opinion about this, this, this matter. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good question because um, um, usually when I go into more details, uh, I tell students, look, uh, the nanoflow, with the nanoflow you have more sensitivity, with the nanoflow you uh, use uh, less solvent, and the other important thing with the nanoflow is that columns are so tiny that we can easily make them in-house. Like we don't need to buy them. We can just buy, take these capillaries and then fill them up with our particles. So uh, everybody tells me, okay, so why people are still using microflow? Why, why people are so stupid? Uh, and then uh, uh, the, answer, the answer is actually easy. Uh, and I tell them, if you go to a hospital, <clears throat> you will probably never see a mass spectrometer with nanoflows. And uh, the real reason why uh, microflows are still popular is because uh, higher flows are more robust. You know, robust in the literal you know, definition of the term. So robust doesn't necessarily mean that they always give you the same outcome, but they will always work in every situation. Right? So uh, uh, an airplane is robust. Right? In the sense, all airplanes, they, all, they don't need to be all identical to each other, but you need to be absolutely sure that if the part, then at one point it lands. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the definition of robustness. And uh, microflows, so larger columns, higher flow rate, they have the advantage that they are very robust. So they, they very rarely get clogged. Uh, they very rarely, they, you know, they, they have mm -hmm. problems in the, in the, you know, in the efficient chromatography. So uh, you lose a little bit in sensitivity, uh, but uh, you, the advantage is that they are very reliable. And, uh, and, and some people are going back to microflow because now mass spectrometers are so sensitive that you are actually okay sacrificing a bit of sensitivity in exchange of not having to worry about your chromatography. You know, uh, when something is more robust, you just put your sample and you go home, right? Nanoflows, they, you know, sometimes they, they, they can be very challenging. Actually, Wagner knows it very well because, you know, we met each other in a, in a laboratory where everybody used nanoflows and there were lots of people constantly in front of chromatographers, you know, trying to adjust, uh, you know, these columns because they were not always working properly. So that, that's, a, that's why people are, are using microflows. Uh, and, you know, I understand them. You know, they have a good point. But the nanoflows, by definition, they are more sensitive. And that's why single cell proteomics, people go, try to go with the flows as low as possible. And then you can imagine that the lower you go with the flow with single cell proteomics, the more difficult it is to have a lot of consecutive runs that don't give you any problem. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, the, you know, thank you for bringing that up. I forgot to say. Uh, thank, thank you for the, the, the answer, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, with, with microflow, you don't make enemies just because you didn't clean up the sample as you should. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then uh, your, uh, your uh, venom samples are particularly dirty as well. <laughs> uh, Simone, I, I have a a short question for you, but it's very specific, uh, just uh, in the subject. Usually when you analyze the data, you have to set a uh, stringency uh, tolerance criteria for the MS1 and MS2 when you do the, the search. And as far as I remember, I ever used uh, 10 ppm for orbit trap analysis. Is it still valid or did it change with the new instruments? So what, what Wagner is asking is there's a very good question. So when you're doing this match, you know, between the spectra that you have and the theoretical fragments that you expect, right, you, you need to provide to the instrument a certain 
uh, leeway, a certain tolerance, right? So you cannot you cannot have only exact matches because also the instruments they make small mistakes. So you need to provide a tolerance window, right? So how tolerant you should be. You know, this of course is different depending on what kind of mass analyzer you have. If the mass analyzer is a very high resolution, you can be very, very specific. If uh, if you are using an ion trap or a quadrupod, then you need to be more tolerant because the ion trap and the quadrupod, they are not as accurate in defining the mass of your molecules. So, <clears throat> uh, historically, you know, since we started using the orbit trap, uh, usually we use as a mass tolerance 10 parts per million of so ppm. 10 parts per million basically means that if you have a mass of 1,000, uh, you are allowed to have a detection error of 0.01 dalton. You know, that is the 10 parts of a million, right? Um, so uh, 10 ppm is, is a standard setting that people still use today, you know, when they have uh, uh, orbit trap spectra. And, you know, but uh, lately, instruments have become a little bit more consistent in calibration. So uh, you will see that on average, people now shift to a, a little bit more narrower tolerance. So why why do you you know decrease the window of tolerance? Right? Because in theory, if something matches 5 ppm, it also matches 10 ppm. Right? So you can just be more tolerant, and there is no problem, right? The problem is the more specific you are, and the more uh, unlikely you will match something randomly. You know, the scoring system that I tell you, that I told you about, if you are unnecessarily very tolerant, you will have more random matches. And for the software, it will become more difficult to say, okay, this is a good hit, this is background noise, right? So you, you need to be as specific as possible when you can. Um, and you're right, by the way, to 10 ppm is something that we used until a few years ago in, in previous generations of, of instruments. Uh, now the, the newer Orbitrap models, so the, uh, the Lumos, the Eclipse, the, the Explorers, uh, usually people by default, uh, they, they use, let's say, four to six ppm tolerances because they can afford it. Because these instruments, they, they have a higher vacuum, uh, they have a more controlled temperature inside, so they go more rarely out of calibration. All right. Yeah, thank you, Simon. That, that was just a complaint from a, a reviewer in an article a collaborator submitted, and I was just, uh, why is this reviewer complaining about 10 ppm as a low stringency criteria? So, uh, that is sound, uh, you know, yeah. that, that sounds like a stupid comment because uh, also, you know, six or seven ppm is not a big difference from, from but, 10. Yeah, it's not such a low stringent, but. Anyway, uh, I'll find something in the literature and reply to that. <laughs> so, yeah, tell them that you are going to be stupid. <laughs> okay, so more questions? Anyone? Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simone. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, see you tomorrow, guys.